All right. Well, thank you so much for showing up here tonight. It really means a lot to me to have familiar faces and to share space with people here that a lot of you have been sharing space with me out at the Sea Watch, and it has been wonderful to to see some great birds, to appreciate some uh, challenging conditions, and hopefully there will be a lot more of that this fall to come. Um, just a quick update about what we saw at the Sea Watch today. It was a pretty slow day. I'm excited for the weather to come in, hopefully uh, switch things up a little bit, but had another marbled merlet, perhaps the same one that we had yesterday. And I know at least one other person got to see it. Um, then we had, hi, Gary. <laughs> And then we had a royal turn uh, that was the first of the season and Rita and Karen were out with me and we were able to share that together. So um, yeah, uh, apologies in advance if anything comes out of my mouth that isn't quite coherent. It's been a long day looking at the water and saying things like scoters over the stacks, loons low. So anything beyond that is a stretch. Um, and thank you Ventura Audubon for helping make this joint uh, meeting tonight a possibility. So that's the Sea Watch update. Talk a little bit about myself and what I'm going to be sharing with you tonight. So birds have been giving me stories for almost my whole life. And uh, right now, I think it's really important that we be sharing those stories because birds are really popular. In culture, birding has gotten some notoriety that I don't, I've never seen it have before. And also right now, birds are in serious decline. They really need their stories told. Within the last 50 years, a lot of you know that we've lost an estimated third of our birds. And I think that storytelling is an act of conservation. And that is what I set out to do, is to tell stories about birds and help them share their stories with a larger audience. So let's get into those stories. It is January, 2021 in Ocala National Forest, which is in central Florida. It's my first night alone on the road. It's not my first night on the road, but it's really different when you're alone. And that's my pickup truck. A lot of you have probably seen it out of the Sea Watch. I've had it for a while. And I was in Ocala National Forest and I had gotten into this campsite. It was a little bit sketchy. Everything feels a little sketchy when you're not used to, to being out there on your own. And I had slipped through the slider window between my cab and my bed. I was sleeping in the bed of my pickup truck. And I think I had my hatchet next to me. I texted my boyfriend my pin where I was just in case, you know, he didn't hear from me for a while. It was kind of a grim night. And I was just very much on edge. I was, you can't really see in this picture, but there's a lot of edgy things in that part of Florida, sharp things. And I also was feeling very on edge. And the next morning, I would be going out. You can see this is a, a pine tree with a, a white badge on it, a white blaze. And that's a good sign that red cockaded woodpeckers are going to be around. And the next morning, I was going to be going out and looking for red cockaded woodpeckers. But that's not what I was thinking about that night. I was thinking about how driving in, I had seen a lot of people that were living in the forest. I was thinking about how just a few days before, uh, the insurrection had happened and just it was a very volatile time. I was thinking about my dad back home in Michigan who had COVID and wondering if it was even a responsible thing for me to be setting off doing this. And I was hopeful the next morning that I would be out looking for red cockaded woodpeckers and starting this sort of alternative big year, which I'll get into in a bit. But I was more thinking about whether I was going to make it the next morning that night. So let's rewind a little bit. Um, like I said, birds have been giving me stories for a very long time. And it all started when I was six. My parents asked me if I wanted to go look for ducks, uh, which is funny considering that I look for ducks professionally now. I don't think anybody knew what was going to happen. My parents really weren't really bird people, uh, but they were nature people. And I was six. The alternative was a nap. When you're six years old, anything that's not a nap is going to be a great, great thing to do. So I was like, sure, let's go look for ducks. And we went and looked for ducks. And I remember I saw a northern shoveler and I argued with my parents because I was like, it looks like a mallard to me. And I saw an American coot and I couldn't understand why that wasn't in the duck section of the field guide. I was kind of a contrarian little child. And that was cool. We went out two weekends later and that's when 
it really took off for me. I wanted to see an owl. I think we're all fascinated by owls for very good reason. And it wasn't dark. It was dusk. We were in southwestern Michigan, which is where I grew up, where I've spent a lot of my time. And we were just driving down this dirt road. And my dad had not wanted to turn down the dirt road because he had washed his car the day before. But my mom always had her intuition was really good. And she was like, Dave, I think we should go down this road. I just have a feeling and her feelings usually were there for good reason. And so we went down this road and I was sitting in the back seat looking out the window and I was like, hey, I saw an owl. And my dad kept driving because I think a few days before I had told him that I had seen a flamingo in the yard. I was in one of those stages and I actually had seen an owl and he kept driving. And when you're six years old and your parents don't believe you, it's the worst thing ever. And I think I was near tears. I really wanted to go back and see this owl. And fortunately, my mom at the last moment looked back and said, Dave, there actually is an owl. You should back up. He did. I don't know how the owl didn't flush. We backed up. They didn't know what it was. We had the old greenback Peterson. We're flipping through. We knew it wasn't a barred owl because uh, it had yellow eyes. We knew it wasn't a great horn because it didn't have big ears. It was a short-eared owl. And from that moment on, I never stopped looking at birds and loving birds and wanting to learn more about birds and wanting to take good care of birds. And as a side note, uh, I've always taken short-eared owls as sort of a sign that I'm a place where I should be. And the last two years that I've been at Pino Sea Watch, I have gotten short-eared owls. So um, I'm very happy to be back. So I did a lot of different seasonal bird gigs, and one of those was in the Pribilof Islands. I guided there in 2015 and 2016. Have any of you all been out to the Pribs? Wow, that actually surprises me. <laughs> Red leg kitty wakes are awesome. You should get out there. Um, but guiding in the Pribilofs is a much different type of guiding. It's a different type of birding. You can see in the left of that photo the big stacks of crab pots. There are no trees on St. Paul Island. That is the shelter. Birders come to St. Paul, not necessarily because they want to see the wonderful birds that are nesting on the cliffs. That's definitely part of it. They come a lot of the time because they want to see birds that are blown in from bad weather in Asia. And it's exciting to go out and not know if you're going to find a bird that maybe has never been found on American soil before. But especially the second year that I was out there, the Pribilofs have this really interesting history. Um, the, there were no human inhabitants that were known and the Russians were trying to find where the fur seals were hauling out because they had kind of gone through the otter population and the fur seals were the next best thing. When they finally found the Pribilofs, they had already enslaved the Aleut people from the Aleutian Islands mm -hmm. and they brought them up to the Pribilofs, mm -hmm. their Aleut slaves, to work in the seal colonies. And they cared so much about these people that they brought up that the first winter they were there, the Russians left, they left the Aleuts and the Pribilofs and they brought more Aleuts back the next year because they assumed that nobody had overwintered. And there's just this huge history of displacement in the Pribilof Islands, and it continues, it persists in the community, and always felt like we were a bit of an extension of that displacement, being there to look for birds that belonged somewhere else, that would have been happier somewhere else. And it was a really intrusive way of birding. You would be trampling down celery patches, and those crab pots in the previous photo, you would be running a piece of plastic down them to try to flush birds out that were just trying to take shelter in an unfamiliar environment. Sometimes people would be lined up behind spotting scopes to see a bird that I knew was going to die because it didn't have the proper resources or the proper strength to get back to where it belonged. And that just did not sit right with me. And when I was out there, I started thinking a lot more about my own approach to birding and what was important to me and how I wanted to do things. And it became important to me to appreciate birds for their essence and not their status. And it is really fun to see new birds on your list. I don't think that there is anything wrong with that. But for me, it felt wrong to just obsess over that and make that the reason why I was birding. I wanted to appreciate birds for birds. And to not have conquest be why I went out in the field. Um, I think there's a lot of interesting vocabulary when we talk about birds and listing, got something, is it good? And I have tried to substitute those things. I try to meet birds, not get them. 
Um, and it takes a lot of intentionality. I'm definitely not perfect, but being out on St. Paul was something that just really, really changed my approach to birding. It was really formative. And I don't want to get too far into the weeds with the pribs, but I found a common swift when I was out there. I think at the first, at the time, it was maybe the fourth time that this bird had been documented in the ABA area. And I had a mixed van full of people that I was guiding that day. A couple of them were from the UK and a couple of them were from the US. And the people from the US were delighted. And the people from the UK were like laughing. They're like, oh, yeah, like it's a common bird for us. We have them in our garden. And it absolutely is common. In some places, it's called common swift. Um, but people would oftentimes be more excited about something that had the word common in its name than the beautiful birds that were pretty much endemic to the Pribilofs. Um, so, yeah, it was a very formative time for me. And I found myself more drawn to stories like, for example, the Everglades snail kite. Uh, as recently as 2011, this is a subspecies of bird that is only found really in South Florida. And as recently as 2011, Audubon, Florida had said that it was going to be functionally extinct within maybe even 20 years. It was just declining so quickly. And the first time that I went to Florida was in 2002, and we just, we didn't see snail kites, even though we looked for them. And around the same time that I was thinking, you know, like the approach to birding that a lot of people go to the Pribilofs with is not for me. I was like, well, what, what kinds of stories are important to me? And the Everglades snail kite, at the time, some research had come out that um, reversing its decline, it was actually adapting morphologically to be able to handle a larger invasive type of apple snail. The snail kites were getting larger bills and larger feet so they could better handle this big snail. And it was like this weird paradox. You have an endangered species that's finding a savior in a species that's on a a list as well. It's not the endangered species list. It's on one of the worst invasive species lists in the world. And I just found that fascinating. And I wanted to find more stories like that and to to celebrate them and to find just those cool relationships and connections. And I liked the idea of being out for a year, dedicating that period of time to doing something. And storytelling is something that has always been important to me as well. Um, when I was really little, I started this thing originally titled Nature Newsletter. Um, my parents devoted a lot of printer paper to that cause. I gave it, I circulated it to the kids I went to church with. And so I thought that I would connect these stories, uh, these dual loves, I guess, of birds and of of storytelling and just go out, try to collect those stories with the hopes of getting material for a book. And I decided to do that in 2021. And so this picture is actually of the day that I left my house in Traverse City. It was January and it was pretty cold there. I have the canoe on the truck, hopeful, hopeful for warmer and less ice. And my plans were really loose. I never been the sort of person that wants to just, uh, I guess, attach myself to a plan because I always end up regretting that. Um, the more effort I put into planning something, the more I have to undo those plans. So I had a few, a few things that I was using as a roadmap of sorts. I had this book called The 500 Most Important Places for American Birds. And it's put out by American Bird Conservancy, and I knew it wasn't going to be possible to visit all of those 500 places, but it's divided into different ecoregions. And I thought, you know, at least I'll try to visit a place that's representative of each of those. And there was another list, a state of the birds report, and it attaches numbers to basically every bird in North America. It's a vulnerability score. And I thought that the species that were higher scoring, so therefore more vulnerable, I was going to focus on searching out those places or those birds and the places that were important to them for this sort of big year. And that was going to be guiding my travels instead of like, oh, there's a crimson collared grosbeak that showed up in South Texas, which was nice, too, because I didn't have to buy plane tickets everywhere at the last minute. <laughs> um, and then because... I'm me. I decided that I didn't want to drive interstates. Have any of you guys read the book Blue Highways by William Heat Moon? Cool. Cool. I have always thought that getting to know a place and really just having an interaction with the landscape that's deeper than surface level, you got to get off the interstates. Uh, you just see the same billboards when you're driving down I-94, I-90. And if you're driving 
the slow roads, you see things like coon pelts for sale, or you meet just random people and you get a much better understanding of place and the things that formed it. I would listen to local radio, for example, when I was driving through Oklahoma looking for lesser prairie chickens that were lacking. I was also listening to reports about hog carcass prices and how the soybean crop was. And it just really helped me appreciate the things that build a place, which is important with an endeavor like this, I think. Um, so here's a map that of where I went. And you'll see that I did not really go much into California, which I think is great now. Again, that's very indicative of my life. I'm here now and I've spent six weeks here last year and I'm really enjoying the, the two weeks that I've been here so far this year. I hope that that sort of relationship continues. And there are so many stories that I could be telling with you all tonight. Every place I went to had a story that deserved telling and it's been hard to pick which ones to share. So I hope that I hope that you enjoy them too. So let's go back to that that morning, that night, the first bit of being on the road alone. I got up the next morning and I was really happy. I see a lot of great sunrises at Point Pinos, but I don't think I appreciated any of them more than that one that morning when I woke up and I was safe. Nobody had come and bothered me during the night and... It was warm. I had a great cup of coffee and I went out to look for red cockaded woodpeckers. Ocala National Forest doesn't have the most red cockaded woodpeckers. I think Apalachicola National Forest has that, um, but they do have a lot and they also have the largest population of Florida scrub jays, which is another species of bird that I was um, including in my, my vulnerable species search. And I was just walking around barefoot and it, seeking out woodpecker taps and I think the first ones that I found were hairy woodpeckers and then I heard one that was a little bit different and I actually found a red cockaded woodpecker that morning that was excavating a cavity and red cockaded woodpeckers have really really cool life histories um, they do this thing where they put their cavities on the south side of the tree and they drill little holes called sap wells around their hole. And the sap wells will leak out sap that's super sticky. It's like turpentine. It is turpentine. <laughs> and these sap wells keep snakes out of the nest cavity, out of the roost cavity. And I was thinking about that that morning, just the different factors that a red cockaded woodpecker needs. They need a lot of longleaf forest, old growth, which had been mostly cut down. There's just a very small fraction of their habitat remaining. And they're called the, the spotted owl of the southeast because a lot of the um, the logging companies have a different idea, I guess, of what should happen with what a working forest should look like compared to the sort of forest that a red cockaded woodpecker needs. And I was thinking about what a red cockaded woodpecker needs for a safe place. And just it felt really visceral comparing that with my own needs for what would a safe campsite look like. And I hadn't really gone into this project thinking that, oh, vulnerable birds and the places important to them are going to mesh so well with my own vulnerability being a woman alone on the road. And I am still amazed that that connection came to me basically the first night that I was out alone on the road. It really was a cool framework for, for everything that happened as the year went on. So after Florida, I started working west and there was this horrible, horrible winter storm, some of you might remember, in Texas and Louisiana. And I had, again, going back to my whole planning thing, I had planned to canoe some rivers in Louisiana and slowly work my way west to, to Texas. But with this winter storm coming in, it was going to flood out all the places I wanted to go, as well as the river accesses to even get down there. So I guess there's something about rain that makes you want to go to the desert. So I was just like, I guess I'll drive to Arizona and work east instead of slowly working my way out to Arizona. So I drove out to Oregon Pipe pa Cactus National Monument area, and I was going to be focusing particularly on LeConte's thrashers there. There's other places where they're more easily found, of course. In fact, I think I saw my first ones ever at Carrizo Plain, which some of you have also probably looked for LeConte's thrashers there. 
they're super cool, super cool birds. Um, they just live in this harsh, harsh landscape. They endure colder temperatures and hotter temperatures in the span of a single year than most birds will in the span of their entire lives. And they don't need to drink water. They can take that from their food sources. They eat scorpions. They are a tough bird and they live in some of the most hostile places in North America. And interestingly, in the areas where they live in Arizona, it's also a place that's really busy with human migrants, which again is an interesting consideration because Lacan's thrashers are non-migratory birds. And for them to be resident in a place that people are trying to get through to get somewhere else, really, I found fascinating and just the hostility of the landscape and being there knowing that a lot of people had died there trying to get to someplace better, seeing Border Patrol everywhere. And at that point, I realized that a lot of my stories were not going to just be stories about birds and bird conservations in their places, how I was feeling experiencing them. There was going to be a lot of layers of environmental justice and human rights issues attached to that story, to those stories, because human rights issues oftentimes are environmental issues. Um, but yeah, there's just a picture of a Leconte's thrasher and a picture of the range. It's really limited. And the, the Ocotillo that was uh, a little bit above the low, low desert, the creosote and saltbush flats where I looked for Leconte's thrashers. And a picture of the road driving in to Cabeza Prieta National Wildlife Refuge. So from there, I continued driving along the border, working my way east. I did a little deviation up into New, New Mexico to look for spotted owls and broke a leaf spring on the way. Didn't realize that until I got to South Texas. I was like, why, why is my truck doing what it's doing? And that was my only really big mishap with the vehicle that year, which was fortunate. That's why I drive a 2000 Toyota Tacoma. <laughs> but the lower Rio Grande Valley is another area that is really, really incredible for birding. Um, if you're a North American birder, you've either gone to South Texas or you want to go to South Texas. There's birds there that not only are not found anywhere else in North America, they are great birds like this green jay. I mean, it really doesn't get better than that. They're And they're common. They're loud. A lot of birds that you go to for places are not going to be that, that overt and that conspicuous. But green jays are a lovely exception to that. Um, but I took the picture of the screen jay actually at the National Butterfly Center, which was a place that at the time was getting a lot, making a lot of headlines because the border wall, the border fence was going to be running through there. And um, there was just a lot of playing up, in my opinion, the immigration issue in South Texas, making it seem a lot more dangerous than what I experienced when I was there. And you can see the that's the Rio Grande River. On one side is the U.S., the other side is Mexico. And while we were there, Swainson's hawks were migrating and scissor-tailed flycatchers were migrating. And one of the coolest afternoons I was there, it was the heat of the day and I was sitting down by the river. My sister had joined me for, for a couple days and we had found a taco shop by driving around with our windows down. So we went there, we got tacos, we were drinking Modelo down by the river, just watching birds stream across and watching them cross the border that we say that people can't cross. And that to me was another really important part of the journey. After I got my leaf, string, leaf spring fixed, I continued east in South Texas and I went out to Boca Chica Beach. And Boca Chica Beach is this really cool area of coastal prairie, and it's just a wonderful place to look for raptors. The first time I went there was probably, hmm, probably 2007, 2008, and it was just full of caracaras and Harris's hawks and white-tailed hawks, and it's a place where they've reintroduced Aplomato falcon, which had been extirpated from the United States. They're the snazziest little falcon. They've got orange pantalones, and they're just, they're great. And so I wanted to go back there to see some of those birds and to experience the coastal prairie, because that was one of the eco-regions that I wanted to visit. And it was a lot, lot different than the first time that I had went there. Uh, here is a crested caracara, one of those emblematic birds of that habitat. They're super cool. 
And so I'm driving out and mostly I was just happy that I could drive again. I had been laid up for a while in, in South Texas waiting for, for my truck to get fixed. And I'm driving out there. And that had not been there the first time that I had gone out. Um, SpaceX and Elon Musk development was being built there. And in fact, there had been a rocket launch that had failed just a couple days before, and the road was closed. You couldn't get out to the beach, which was kind of interesting because Texas actually has a law called the Open Be Beach Act, and you are supposed to be able to access the beach if you're in Texas. That's the law. But SpaceX shuts the road down to the beach pretty frequently, or at least they were at the time. And I was curious because there's a National Wildlife Refuge out there, too. And I was able to talk with one of the biologists that was connected with the refuge, not, not a federal employee, but somebody working for a nonprofit. And it's just crazy out there. It's like a sci-fi scene of rockets <laughs> sprouting out of the prairie. And talking with people that were connected with that, they were like, yeah, there's a lot of concerns that we have about this. First of all, we're not able to get out to our field sites as much as our grant money says that we need to put in the hours and when SpaceX blows up a rocket that goes all over the the coastal prairie and the tidal flats then they go out and drive into sensitive habitat without getting the permitting to quickly retrieve those parts of the rockets that blew up and he, the person that I spoke with said that they were seeing decreases in shorebirds that find that area really important. It's critical wintering habitat for piping plovers. Wilson's plovers nest there. A lot of birds find that place just to be vitally important. And I'm not sure uh, that SpaceX endeavors and bird conservation are things that go with each other. And the human issue of that was that there's this little village called Boca Chica Village out there, and Musk had said essentially that it wasn't safe for people to live there, and he was buying them out and moving in his own employees because I guess it was safe for them to live there. And he was going to rename Boca Chica Beach to Starbase, and I think that naming is a big part of ownership and ownership and vulnerability are things that are at odds. And I miss how Boca Chica Beach was the first time I visited it. I hope that it doesn't go too much further down the road it was. The other thing that was crazy to me is when I was driving back, it was shift change. And this is a road that was super quiet the first time I went there. I think I saw two or three other vehicles. And everybody was just racing around me to get back to the city because Boca Chica is kind of out in the middle of nowhere. And it was Friday night. Everybody wanted to go be somewhere that they found to be more exciting. And I definitely felt a little bit like prey out on the Raptor road, getting out of everybody's way, getting chased down. I went back to the Great Lakes and did a migration count on Manitou Island in Lake Superior, lived in a lighthouse. And while I wasn't particularly focused on a vulnerable species of bird there, I think that migration counts are just one of the most important tools that we have of monitoring bird populations. That's why I'm here at Pinos is because I believe that the Sea Watch is and it's such an important way of gathering that sort of data. And I always am in the space of observation and it's almost meditative for me to be there and reflect on this ancient rhythm and read historical reports of places that say, you know, the sky was black with hawks and it's not like that anymore. And I don't think it's gonna be like that in my lifetime, maybe not in anybody's lifetime. And I wonder when I'm out here, when I'm on any migration count, you know, are people gonna look at my reports and my numbers someday and say the same thing? Wow, it must have been so good then. And I try to intentionally appreciate every bird that goes by on a migration count. And it's very much life and death out there, especially on Lake Superior. I love Monterey Bay because it seems like birds are coming here because it's a place that has a lot to offer. Lake Superior is not like that. Lake Superior is do or die. <laughs> um, you've got to get out or else you're screwed, um, which is evidenced in uh, the feather piles that were everywhere on Manitou Island. Birds that are getting there, it's about five miles offshore, birds that are getting there and trying to make land, they have to run this gauntlet of merlins and sharp hawks and herring gulls. And this is a rough-legged hawk. It's one of my favorite species of birds. And while I was counting out there at Manitou, 
I saw a rough leg come in and it was low and it was fighting the headwind and I was watching it in the scope. It was a really flat day on Lake Superior and I could see its wingtips dragging on the surface of Lake Superior. About 20 minutes before that, I had watched a northern plicker kind of doing the same thing, coming in exhausted. It had hit the water. A mob of herring gulls went down on it. I've seen what herring gulls do to birds that go in the water, and I didn't watch what they did with the flicker because I knew how it ended. I didn't want to see it. I like flickers. Brian's not here, so I can say this. I don't really like herring gulls. <laughs> <laughs> So this rough legged comes in and its wingtips are dragging the water. And I'm like, oh no, my heart is in my throat. I love rough legged hawks. They are one of my favorite birds. They're just so, so cool. And they take on big water crossings in a way that most beautios don't. And I watched it, it dragged, it dragged, and then it dropped in the water. And it was just floating there. And the herring gulls saw it about the same time that I did. And they came swarming in and I did not want to watch, but I needed to know how the story ended. And I just forced myself to keep looking through my scope. It was like the rest of the world just kind of faded out. And the hawk found enough energy in itself to fend off the herring gulls. It was coming in closer to shore. I was thinking, you know, like, will I go in the lake and get it? If, if it comes close enough, it was May. The water was really cold. I was thinking that, yes, I probably would do that. And I was feeling bad because the last fall I had been out in the same place and had killed 156 mice in the lighthouse that we were staying in. And I was like, oh no, are there mice left on this island if this hawk comes in? Um, Monterey Audubon puts me up in a much, much better place. <laughs> and so I'm watching this hawk just struggling to live. A young bald eagle came in after the herring gulls left and the hawk found enough in it to, to show the eagle that it wasn't going to be easy prey. And then it found enough energy to come back in, to lift up out of the water and to fly the last couple hundred yards to shore. And I could feel my own weariness as that bird made landfall. Like I could feel the bird's weariness and myself, the relief. And I don't know what happened to that bird. It dove into the boreal forest and I'm sure it had a long rest ahead of it. But what I was thinking about after that was just, I never give that sort of energy to just mere survival that the birds that we see out there do on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. So after that, I went out uh, to the prairies by way of boreal forest through Minnesota. I went, wanted to go to this place called American Prairie Reserve because I really wanted to see some of those prairie birds. Grassland birds are in really steep decline. And I was torn between several potential prairies. I didn't know if I wanted to go to Thunder Basin in Wyoming or maybe Pawnee in Colorado or American Prairie Reserve. And I was drawn to American Prairie Reserve because I had a friend from the Smithsonian who was working there. And he said, basically, you know, it's perfect for your project. Um, it's got all the birds you're interested in. It's got all the, the tension and undertones of what the ranchers think should happen with the land versus what conservationists think should happen. American Prairie Reserve essentially is uh, the way that they operate is a lot of you are probably familiar. A ranch is maybe a small piece of land, but they have grazing rights through the BLM, the Bureau of Land Management, to a huge amount of land. So American Prairie Reserve is coming and buying ranches and also getting those grazing rights. And instead of running cattle with the grazing rights, they're running bison. And the ranchers that live in that area are not happy about that. And I can appreciate that. I mean, I think all of us, when we have our way of life threatened, what we know, we're going to be up in hackles. And the way that American Prairie Reserve operates is aggressive, but it's also effective from conservation. The places where they're putting bison in are the streams are growing back vegetation and some of the more natural rhythms of the ecosystem are coming back. And beyond that, it's just an incredible place. It is the old west. You can be out there and not see a fence post, not see a telephone line. You can imagine what that landscape looked like. And it is one of the last places that people think that large scale temperate grassland conservation can happen. Um, yeah, that's a quote from my friend that is the researcher there. And 
yeah, just being out there in that magnitude, uh, habitat fragmentation is something that makes me feel very not whole. And I realized at some point over the course of the year that I was drawn to places that felt whole because I felt more whole and safe inside those places. Um, I got to see a mountain plover chick while I was there, which was adorable. Uh, but Andrew, my friend, was actually researching horned lark survivorship. And that is a, a horn lark chick that's being weighed in the lid of a pill bottle because they're just that small. Yeah. <laughs> and to to mark them, there's such a high mortality rate with small ground nesting birds that we actually had child safe nail polish. And we were painting the toenails of these little baby horn larks with colors like Piggly Wiggly and... <laughs> Uh, there's always funny, quirky, strange elements to research. And that was one of the many ones out at American Prairie Reserve. Um, but it was also cool just driving around the landscape. I did some explorations by myself and ended up at a bar. I didn't go to very many bars that year because I just didn't think it was a wise thing to do, both on a limited budget and being alone. But I did go to a bar in Zortman, Montana, and ended up sitting next to the suicide counselor for Fort Belknap Reservation. And his name was Lonnie. He went by hugs. He was such an interesting person to talk to. And just by putting myself out of my comfort zone, which I did every day, not usually by going to bars, but every day was an uncomfortable day. I can honestly say that in some shape or form. Um, I met people that just really helped me understand what I was doing and really add color and layers to what I was setting out to do. And so that was really, really special. On a On a sad note, though, Andrew was talking up this prairie dog town and he took me out there and a few days before I had been just a place that was full of life and there were burying beetles that were flying out of the holes when we went there some of them had cobwebs over them there was plague going through the prairie dog towns at that time which is a not abnormal part of that ecosystem at least now but it does wreak havoc and the prairie dog decline is part of the reason why mountain plovers are as vulnerable as they are. And while I was out there in that beautiful landscape, I was just thinking about all the different collapses that that particular place has seen. Um, insects, locusts, uh, the prairie dogs, the birds, and even the bison, of course, were one of the first and the native people. But even the ranchers, could their decline could be considered as a clap. So it's a beautiful place that holds a lot, a lot of change and in some ways a lot of sadness. Uh, my California leg, which I included for, for you guys tonight, I went to see and hear marbled merlets in the redwoods. I had never seen the redwoods before, and I had never experienced marbled merlets off of the ocean, so I did that. But being from Michigan, which is probably one of the safest places on Earth, um, Northern California just feels a little sketchy. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, I remember driving and stopping and getting gas somewhere north of, I think it was between Crescent City and whatever south of there. And my truck had all of its windows and I had all of my teeth and I was like, I am very much in the minority here. I would like to go somewhere else. And a couple of days before that, I had been at Matol Rivermouth. Have any of you guys been there? Uh, it's the King's Range, the Lost Coast Trail. It's absolutely gorgeous. I would love to do a sea watch there sometime and just see what's happening. But while I had been setting up camp there, there had been a man that was walking around with his rifle, just sighting it down the road. It was like July. And I was like, I, I'm from a family of hunters. We don't usually sight those down the road. And also July, I'm sure I convinced myself that something had to be in season because otherwise it was a long dead end road and it was getting late and I didn't have anywhere else to go. And I was like, January, me in January, I would have really freaked out. But me in July, I was I figured out how to deal with it. <laughs> and but I wanted to get away from the coast. So I found a spot on Ebert, actually. I wasn't particularly focused on one species or one place, but I wanted to experience some of the birds of the Sierras, the specialties that are just globally limited in range. And I found a hot spot called Dr. Rock. And I was like, that sounds cool. Like maybe that's a safe place to camp. 
So I started driving up without knowing anything about this place. And I'm sure that you guys know a lot more about the Geo Road than I knew about the Geo Road at that point. But I'm driving up and it's getting dark and it's a paved road, but there's boulders in the road. There's grass growing out of the center line. It's like, man, a couple of winters, a forest fire, this road is never going to be drivable again. What's going on with this road? And I had no idea at that point. And I also didn't have self-service. So it took a few days to figure out how cool it was. Um, but I slept up there and the next morning decided I would hike up to, to Dr. Rock, which was not far from where I ended up camping. And I was sitting there in a turnout, just writing in my journal and wondering what was happening about with this road. And there was a family of mountain quail. It's not a very good picture, but mountain quail are awesome. And they were walking up the steep hillside because that's what they do. They run away. They run uphill. That's what they're known for doing from danger. And a lot of organisms are not going to run uphill. The mountain quail do. And that's sort of what I had felt like I was doing that day was running uphill to get to a camping spot that wasn't the coast. And this mountain quail family was just kicking down a small landslide into the road and adding to the boulders that were already there that you can see in that picture, I'm sure. And I thought it was really cool that this road, which I later learned about, um, had not, it wasn't supposed to be built essentially. And the mountain quail feet were reclaiming it. But the Geo Road, uh, it goes through an area that the Yurok tribe used to go to to prepare for their renewal of the earth ceremony. So a place that was just incredibly sacred and renewal of the earth. How beautiful is that concept? And the U.S. Forest Service, which also claimed ownership to that land, decided that with the redwood conservation, that the old growth trees, with redwoods being pretty much off limits, the old growth trees that were up in the areas of the Geo Road was going to access were really financially viable and they should be cut down. And so they started building this road through sacred land to make the logging easier and connect to communities. And the road never went through because of a series of lawsuits. At one point, um, the Yurok tribe actually sued the US Forest Service on the basis of violation of religious freedom. And I'm not remembering the exact details right now. I think in one level of court that went through and then it was overturned as it progressed and was fought more. Um, but yeah, the Geo Road doesn't go anywhere now, which I thought was great. And it was just a cool experience that I was able to find by needing a safe place to camp, wanting to see mountain quail and just not really having a plan. As the year went on, I went down to Louisiana and I'm really glad that I was not able to do Louisiana in February because Louisiana doesn't have a lot of public land. And I don't know, the people there are not as nice as they are elsewhere in the South. And I got more comments there about how I shouldn't be there alone, how it either wasn't safe or it just was not appropriate for me to be there than I got anywhere else. And I think that that really would have discouraged me in February, but in November, I was so close to the end of things and I had also been alone for so long that I was like, yeah, I, I can get through it. <laughs> it's just one state, it's November. And Louisiana, man, you could write a whole book years worth of environmental conservation, human interest stories about Louisiana, the coastal loss, the deep water horizon spill, you're driving through and you're listening to the radio and you're still hearing about how, you know, if your health has been impacted by this, here's resources for you. And it's, the coast is being lost and it just like, the culture seems like it's being eroded by grief. Hurricane Ida had just gone through and I was driving through places where the FEMA trucks were just out and it seemed like some sort of funeral ritual. They were black and just taking, the trucks were black and they were just taking people's whole lives that have been ruined by this hurricane and taking them away. And you could feel that in the place for sure. But the cool bird thing that I did in Louisiana was Audubon, Louisiana has these walks for rails and it helps Audubon, Louisiana out too because Black rails and yellow rails are species that are not only scarce and vulnerable, they are extraordinarily cryptic. And so it was, it worked out well for everybody. I was like, cool, less dark hours for me to be alone in my truck wondering <laughs> if I'm okay to be camped here. 
And also I get to help out a, a conservation effort. So to drag for rails to flush them because they were catching them and banding them, um, they have a long rope and it's got plastic containers with lug nuts and cat toys and things that make a lot of noise when you shake it. And it was quite an endeavor. I was like, man, we're the weirdest people. <laughs> anyway, it was Friday night. It's an area of Louisiana that's just not inhabited. It's just coastal wildlands. And here we are walking through a marsh, totally dark, um, catching rails. We did not get any black rails that night, but we did get some yellow rails. And the area where we were was a place where Audubon, Louisiana has found more black rails than any of the other marshes they survey. And it's difficult to see, but if you look directly left from my headlamp beam, you'll see some lights on the horizon. And there's actually a natural gas plant there. And right next to this marsh, that's really important to the rails. And they were in the process of trying to get approval to put another plant even closer to the basically between me and the plant that's already there and yeah with the coastal lost black rails are little guys they don't like to get their feet wet that's one of the things about their natural history and as the water rises it's getting harder and harder for them to keep their feet dry uh, but this yellow rail was a species that I had never seen before I had only heard them and it was very cool to get to have it in hand the first time that I experienced it and the one that I got to hold, I think we we caught three or four that night. The one that I got to hold was particularly sassy. It bit me. It was the heaviest. It was the just the most inconvenient to handle. And Jonathan, who was in charge of the surveys, asked me if I wanted to release it. And of course I did. And that was just amazing to carry it over to the grass and kind of squat down, gently put it down and watch it just walk and disappear skinny as a rail I understood what it meant and to see it go into this lake world that we have no idea what it's like down there I just was imagining little railways going through the grass uh <laughs> yeah so that was cool the last thing that I did that year on the road um is I went to northern Minnesota because I hadn't had winter and I wanted to encompass that in the scope of my story, especially as winter is getting harder and harder to find. And I also wanted to know, end on a note of familiarity, have a strong finish. My friend Hannah is a hawk owl researcher. And at the time she was at University of Minnesota Duluth. A lot of you have probably heard of her because her work has gotten a lot of notoriety and for good reason. And so she was studying Northern hawk owls and she hadn't caught any yet. Her, uh, her study was going to be to put transmitters on them to figure out how much they were moving around in their winter range and where the birds in Minnesota were going. And so I went there, it was getting to be around New Year's and she was frustrated because she hadn't caught any owls and she was just putting incredibly long hours of driving and looking for, for hawk owls. They're a low density species. And in Northern Minnesota, there just aren't many roads that are plowed in the winter. So you're driving the same roads over and over and over again and hoping for something. And so I met up with Hannah and I met up with Frank Nicoletti, who's connected with Hawk Ridge Bird Observatory. He's been there for a very long time. And it was just, it would have been enough driving around with the two of them and hearing Frank tell stories about his connection with that place and being like, oh yeah, we caught a great gray at that corner. Or, oh yeah, a hawk owl was at this other corner and just being like, whoa, like when's the last time we've had an eruption like that? That's so cool. Um, and we go we went to bed it was I think 40 below and which was really interesting because when I had gone through that landscape earlier in the summer and not been that far from where we were trying to get hawk owls uh, I had actually stopped at a line three protest camp and participated in a sweat lodge so it was this place where I had been incredibly hot and now later in the winter I was incredibly cold um ice fishing is a big thing up there the dominant traffic on the roads were pickup trucks that were pulling just uh ice fishing houses they're like trailers but you pull them out on the lake and have posh warmth so you can drink beer and, and ice fish for for perch or walleye or muskie whatever and we went to bed and I was like Hannah are you dreaming about hawk owls at this point because I I mean I've only been here for two weeks and I'm already dreaming about loons and scoters and I think last night I dreamt about Bonaparte skulls mm -hmm. and she was like oh yeah I absolutely am and she was like I'm starting to think they don't exist and we went out 
the next morning and riding around with us we had a pigeon we had mice we had a russian dwarf hamster it was just a really weird assembly because that's what happens when you're you're out trying to trap birds of prey and we we're up near the canadian border and we had a tip about a hawk owl that somebody had found on a christmas bird count a couple days before and Hannah said, there it is. It was just like a very nonchalant, there it is. And that's the way the hawk owls are. Once you find them, they're on top of things. They're obvious and they're super prey driven. So the finding them is the difficult part if you're trying to ban them. And she set her trap up and yeah, within a matter of minutes, it had come in. And it was so, so cool. This was the first hawk owl to ever have a transmitter put on it. And this transmitter they were designed especially for her project actually and this hawk owl kept its transmitter is the last i know it had gone back to manitoba and i can't remember if it came back into cell signal so we could learn if it came back to minnesota but um, it was doing well it was hunting and hannah is very very careful with how she does research um, i really appreciate how her approach with research is similar to my approach with birding it's not a conquest thing it's like this animal has a gift to offer how can I take good care of it and steward it well so that uh, I can learn more about it and we can care better for them and their landscape. They're a species that's really climate sensitive and they've been declining. And as climate change progresses, they probably will continue to decline. So it's important to learn more about what sort of landscapes and what sort of winter ranges they have. And we were euphoric going back to Duluth. She had caught the first hawk owl, put the first transmitter on a hawk owl ever, and all her hard work was beginning to pay off. I think that winter she put seven more transmitters on hawk owls, and she had something on her fridge in Duluth that was just a little piece of paper that said, do something every day that scares you. And I was like, well, I did pretty well with that this year. <laughs> I'm sure I did pretty well with that for my dad that year too. Um, I am still so grateful that he just kind of was like, yeah, she'll be all right. And I was. Um, and I wish that there was a lot more that I could share with you tonight. I hope that you have so enjoyed the, the stories that I selected. These spotted owls were another wonderful, sensitive species that I had a really cool experience with. And I'm still working on writing the book, so you'll just have to read about it there. Um, but in closing, I just want to say something that my mom shared with me. She passed away from cancer about six years ago, and she went through this phase. She had a brain tumor, and it just it changed her mind a lot. She called it the bright lights. Um, it was a happy thing for her and the worst thing for the rest of us. And in those last few months, she, she said some really profound things. And one of those was everybody has a story. Everybody has a song. Like we might have different ways of telling those stories. We might have different words. But at the end of the day, everybody has a story and everybody has a song. And storytelling has always been important to me, and it's become more important to me through that. And that's really what I set out to do, is to help those that don't have human words tell their stories in a way that makes them relatable. So thank you so much for showing up tonight to hear some of those stories. And let's look at this really cute picture of a piping plover chick that I monitored the year before I went on the road um, while I ask if anybody has questions. And I'd like to see if Ventura Audubon has questions first. Check the chat. Hi, Amanda. Can you hear me? I'll put a question over here then while we're working out our tech. Are there any? So from Ventura Audubon, can you hear me? Where did you most like to go back to? Oh, that is such a hard question. Um, yeah. Honestly, I think what that trip reinforced was how much I love Lake Superior. Those were my favorite regions or the ones that touched Lake Superior. I think the Olympic Peninsula is another place that I felt like I just barely tapped into and I'd like to go back to. I was focusing on marbled merlets there as well and actually had a chance to climb up into a Douglas fir about 180 feet with somebody who had found a marbled merlet nest just randomly climbing trees. I hadn't climbed a tree before like that. And my boyfriend is a industrial rigger and he was like, that's a lot to take on for your first tree. But I trusted the person that was giving me this experience and 
yeah, I would like to go back to the Olympic Peninsula and see what more it has to offer. Perfect. I was going to say, if we unmute this, hopefully we can hear um, Ventura Audubon people now. <laughs> can you guys hear us? Yeah. Awesome. That's awesome. Um, so I, we find your stories really amazing. Um, one of the things that I think our connection with you is that with what we're doing here in Ventura County and with Ventura Audubon is a story. And, th and that's kind of a great connection we have as people who are in conservation and people who are like really care. And it, I got from your presentation that you really care, which is hard to find, right, amongst us. Um, you know this, it's like, oh yeah, I'm gonna drive to a bridge and I'm shoot a bird. Okay, good, I got my life bird, Wee, I'm good. Um, so if, if I, you can indulge us, um, if you wouldn't mind allowing me to share my screen, I wanna show you a video that kind of talks about um, kind of what you're doing, if I can do it. Yeah, we're gonna try to figure this out on our end too. It's really great. Okay, so just not share your screen. We got to do it on that one. So. Great. Right. So what we're going to talk about, because I really am inspired by your talk, um, was we are boots on the ground for conservation for western snowy plovers in California leash turns. Um, and what I find in your stories is the same thing. Um, these animals go through an amazing struggle just to survive, right? And we talk about humanity, but these animals, and if you think about a Western Snowy Plover chick, if they, if they run 100 yards, that's like probably 30, 40, 50 miles for us. That's the amount of energy they expend. So this is a 20-second video that is on our website, um, the TorontoBond.org, and it's on our bird blog. But as you can see in the lower left, we have our little chick. Uh, actually, we can't see your screen bins. Uh oh, wait a minute. I know what I did wrong. Share. And I have to hit share. Ah. Now, can you see it? Um, How do we exit out of ours on this second. one? I can see it. <laughs> you can see it on the laptop. Just a sec. See if I can share. Do it this way. Uh, I know those of, those of you online can. <laughs> there we go. All right. So here's our chick. <laughs> and there's the other one. In right in the middle and this is every year they come to our beaches and if you don't know the biology they're kind of like like chicken chicks they feed themselves so these little guys are running around all day long surviving and I found what you were talking about was that inspiring for us right because that's kind of what we're trying to do with these animals. And I know I noticed that that's kind of what you were doing when you were talking about um, Lake Superior's animals. We're trying just to get to the other side. And I found that parallel really cool. So thanks for your talk. And I'm looking forward to having you in person in our, <laughs> at our chapter meeting, um, which you'd be a great, a great success. So thanks again. And on behalf of Audubon, Ventura, awesome. And Christmas bird count, December 30th. Be there or be square. <laughs> so true. <laughs> any other questions in the room or any folks in the chat? Girls in the chat here. Everybody saying, great job. I have been to Traverse City. Very cool. <laughs> Incredible journey, inspiring and inspiring. <laughs> I so appreciate your soulful approach to the nature we love. Any other questions in the room? I have a question. Yeah. Yes. If you're far enough in your book writing, I'm interested in finding out how you're organizing it. Is it by location? Is it by bird? Or I would say it's mostly chronological with some flashbacks, but it seemed I tried the, I'm not a very linear person. And I really didn't want to have a linear format, but it seemed like moving through the progression of the year seemed like the most rational approach because I just evolved a lot during that year. 
and it would have been really awkward to jump around. Um, I would say that like it's a sequence of chapters, it's narrative nonfiction, and each one of those chapters has a clear bird, clear place, clear habitat. A lot of them have an obvious issue, point of tension as well. But it starts in January with red cockaded woodpeckers and ends in January with northern hawk owls. Yeah. What have you done um, since then? What's your life been like? Um, well, building my bank account back up. <laughs> I did have a Patreon account during the year that I was on the road and just lived really simply. And I had a lot of support through that. I was sharing my long form writing with people that supported and also write the you with Patreon. It's a platform that people kind of sign up for a monthly subscription. And I had different levels of supporters, the highest levels of supporters. I was actually sending postcards every month as well which was really fun because I would go to a national park and pick really cute postcards and <laughs> imagine the people receiving them. And sometimes I'd go to those people's houses and see my postcards on their fridge. Yeah, but since then, I've been working at Whitefish Point and doing their migration count there in the spring. In the summer and the fall, I actually work in the service industry in Traverse City. I bartend and I waitress and get paid to hang out with my friends, essentially, which is great. And also keep my brain up for pinos i try not to write anything down on a shift and it definitely helps a lot at the sea watch here and the last winter i rented a cabin for three months to figure out where i wanted to go with my manuscript i did that in the upper peninsula and i probably won't do quite that this winter but definitely have some quiet dedicated writing time and get further with the manuscript yeah thank you for your question yeah so interestingly we had a discussion of these in the presentation last last week. Yes. You know, like around the United States, <laughs> your map is the Curtis, but it looks just like his. <laughs> well, he did his on bike, so that's way cooler. <laughs> yeah. But this, this story is worth yeah, I have not read his book yet, and as soon as my eyes have recovered from Sea Watch, it is right up at the top of my list. Um, I can tell from people that have attended his talk, I've heard so much good about it, how amazing that you guys were able to get him to speak here. Yeah. Just like he had a deep personal relationship with the journey as well, and I'm looking forward to seeing that lens. But, yeah. Anything else? Just real quick, I was going to say, you, you of course are all welcome out at the Point Pino Sea Watch, as I think probably 75% uh, of you <laughs> yeah. have been out there. And um, we have kind of a little group of volunteers that help do outreach um, uh, morning and evening and on the weekends and stuff. But you can come at any time. Volunteers might be there anytime because there's kind of just, we're just kind of like Allison groupies. We just want to learn from her and like be out there and kind of share in the joy of of watching these birds come by. So it's really fun. Hope you stop by. Yeah, come to Seabird School. There you go. And even if it's raining and stormy, we'll be there. So um, <laughs> that's my plug for Sea Watch. Um, but yeah, any final questions before we wrap up? Please make sure to take the last of the goodies out on the table. Dan Scott, who normally bakes all of our delicious treats, she's at home with a back injury. So this is all I had to provide. I apologize. But please take the macaroons and things that are out there. Any other questions? Okay,